Hello, and welcome to the May 2nd, 2021 edition of Emmanuel Church Rio Rico's online virtual worship. Let's pray. Lord God, we're surrounded by trouble, by pain, by sorrow, by fear, but also by hope and by love and by, most of all, your presence. Keep us close to you, Lord. Let us depend on you completely and totally in all ways. Be with those who are suffering now. Be with those who are grieving. Be with those who are uncertain about what's coming next, Lord. But mostly be with us. Be our light. Be our hope. And be our guardian. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. We're continuing our look at John, words of love from the Son of Thunder, study of the gospel according to John. And I'm calling today's lesson, No Division. Now, we talk about God as being one God, but we also talk about God as being one God in three persons. This is what we know as the Trinity, one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it is this passage in John 10 is one of the reasons we talk about this. This is where we get this understanding that there is one God in three persons, although really only two persons are discussed in today's passage. So let's take a look at John chapter 10. And we're, we're going on from where Jesus was talking about himself as the Good Shepherd last week. So looking at John chapter 10, starting uh, in verse 22, we'll see that Jesus' works proclaim him. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. Now we more typically know the festival of dedication as Hanukkah. So that means it was taking place sometime in what we consider the month of December, uh, the middle of winter, even there in Israel. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. John chapter 10, verses 22 through 25. Jesus' actions tell us more loudly than even his words do who he is, what he is, and what his role is. He's given sight to the blind. He's healed the sick and the infirm. He's cleansed the skin of lepers. He has, he has made those who were hopeless full of hope again. And it's his works, his actions, that proved who he was. Now, we, we only see the reports of his actions. We only see the reports of his words. But even still, what he did echoes down today and shows him to be who he said he was, more surely than anything anybody else could have said about him. Furthermore, we are safe in his hands starting in verse 26. But you do not believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to me. I uh, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. John 10 verses 26 through 29. Jesus is telling the Pharisees who are questioning everything he does, everything he says. He says, well, you don't know me because you're not one of my sheep. You're not one of mine. You see, when we have placed our faith in Jesus, when we have trusted him as our Savior, when he has cleansed us from our sins, when he has made us whole again, we are in his hands and we remain safe in his hands. There are those who would teach that you can lose 
your salvation. That if you mess up, that's it. You're out of there. You're not saved anymore. Your name is erased from the book of life. And yet, this passage tells us that that's not true. Because you see, nobody can pluck us out of his hands. And Jesus goes on to say, my father, who's greater than all, has given them to me. Nobody can snatch them out of his hands. We are safe in his hands. There is no need to fear that we're going to do something wrong and we'll lose our salvation, that we will no longer be part of his flock. The, the shepherd carried a couple of different implements with him. Uh, we hear about this in the 23rd Psalm where, where David writes, your, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you see the rod or the club and the staff were the two tools of the shepherd. The shepherd carried a, a rod or a big stout stick, a club, if you will, kind of like a baseball bat, I guess. He would carry that, that club with him, that rod, to beat off any attacking animals. It was stout enough that if he hit them with it, it would hurt them and it would stop them. And so he would carry that rod around with him to protect his flock from external threats. Ah, but the staff served a different purpose. You've seen little Bo Peep, I bet, pictures of a little Bill Peep with, a, with that long, long stick in her hand with a big curve on the end. Perhaps you've even seen old shows, television shows, where they would have a big hook like that to drag somebody off the stage. But you see, that great big hooked staff that is the sign that bishops use in some church, as a matter of fact, as a symbol of their role, that, that staff with the curved hook on the end was to protect the flock from themselves. Because you see, sheep are dumb. They're incredibly dumb animals. And they will, they'll wander all over the place and get themselves in the worst kind of trouble because they really aren't, they're not very smart. And they're not very good at taking care of themselves. And one of the things that they do is fall off of cliffs and fall down holes and into crevices and into places that they just can't get out again. And you see, the shepherd can use that hook to hook it around the sheep and bring him back from where he has fallen. You can also use it to grab a sheep or a lamb that's wandering off in the wrong way, wandering into some place that could be very dangerous for him. And that hook is to protect the flock from itself and the rod is protect the flock from the external threats. And so there is no one who can get to the flock while the shepherd is there on duty. And our shepherd is always on duty. And we are safe in his hands. Finally, the father and son are one. And let me read here, starting in verse 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I cannot tell you what a radical statement this was to first century Jews. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, and I think this is an amazingly calm statement for somebody who's about to be stoned. I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. And this is from Psalm 82, 6. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, and as an aside here, he most certainly did. Even though you do not believe me, believe the works. 
that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tries to seize him, but he escapes their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. This is from John chapter 10, verses 30 through 42. Jesus now says, I and the Father are one. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. This is where we get the idea that Jesus is God. Why do we get that idea? Because that's what he just said. That he, the Son, is in the Father. And the Father is in him. Now, how does that work? I don't know. We'll have to ask him when we get to heaven. Because I honestly do not understand how that is. How they can be two distinct persons and yet one God. And yet, that's exactly what this says. This is precisely what Jesus is saying to us right here. He is God. When we place our faith in him, we're placing our faith in God completely. And when we know Jesus, we are able to know God. And without knowing Jesus, we don't really know God. But when we know Jesus, everything that can be known about God is known to us by knowing Jesus. He is the focus of our belief, of our faith, of our knowledge, because he himself is also God. It is beyond me to explain how that works, but I do believe it, and I do know it's true. And I know this because I know it in my own life. I know the presence of Jesus in my life. I know what he has done for me, to me, and through me. And it shows me who he is. And I have no reason to think he is not exactly what he says he is. That the Father and the Son are indeed one. Now, just one quick thing here. They, they try to stone Jesus. They try to grab Jesus. And yet it doesn't happen. I don't think it's because Jesus is a really great sprinter. I think this is another miracle. He walks out without these people who hate him, these people who are furious at him, these people who want to kill him. He walks right through them without him even stop, them even stopping him because it was not his time. His time was coming, but it was not his time yet. He was not to die at the festival of Hanukkah, and so he didn't. That would come at Passover, as we read and we talked about not too long ago at Easter time. Let's pray. Lord Christ, teach us who you are. Show us who you are by your works. Help us to always remember that we are safe in your hands that nothing can drag us away from you, that we belong to you, and nothing can change that. No one and no thing. Help us to trust you fully and help us to love you absolutely as you have already loved us. Help us to show others the works you have done in our lives by the lives that we live and the words that we say. This we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Go in peace, and may God bless you.